I do believe we are. We are live. We're back. Free Market Live, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be discussing a very, very important topic today. And that is the current market. The depression. The depression. The prices are crashing. The market is crashing. I'm not depressed. Depressed. I'm not depressed at all. This market isn't crashing. The market is taking somewhat of a correction across certain regions of the market, certain yeah. parts of the market, if yeah. you will, right? So I am not going to beat around the bush and give you a bunch of small talk. I am going to go with our first topic, and that is the current market status. So the current market status is topic number one, and that's probably going to break into uh, what's called subtopics right and the first subtopic is going to be wholesale versus retail 90 seconds ago so wholesale versus retail one of the topics i wanted to cover very quickly was about let's call it about a month ago you got 90 for, seconds for easy for easy math um we started to see some things change in regards to prices on the dealer chats on the, on the wholesale level right we had china closed down that was the first thing that started the price correction china closed down people were not able to buy watch therefore a domino affected into our market, the European market, and any other market. And the problem was, was the retail customers weren't feeling that yet. So especially because we buy so many watches, our retail customers started getting a little upset with us. What's going on? Why are you paying these prices now when a week before you're paying 10, 15% over? I tried to explain to them that whatever happens in China first, just like the New York stock exchange in New York dictates what happens to the rest of the financial markets, China and Asia, whatever happens there comes back to us here. You got another 30 seconds. No, oh, I thought it was uh, 90 seconds total. 90 seconds. You got another 30 seconds left. Okay, so one of the things that... Completely. On YouTube, I'm not going to mention any names, but start causing panic. And yeah, you're done. Where's the horn? Yeah, do, do, do we not have a horn or something? Let's sort of count Yeah, we should have had a horn. And there's a horn. Anyway, wholesale versus retail. My 90 seconds. I'm ready to go. Let's start the clock. I'm going to tell you really, really quickly. Obviously, in the last year and a half, you have a ton of people that got into the watch business, including retail clients that all of a sudden decided they're going to be watching those because they're connected to the new AD. Still? Right? The market could not, cannot go forever just based on that. Yes, China caused a big uh, drop in the oh, you know, We'll talk about that momentarily. But the bottom line is, is that there were too many hands in the over the last year. And the prices have gotten to a level wholesale that they shouldn't have been at. Right. And we'll talk about the specific models in a minute. But the bottom line is this, and I'll break it down really quick. You had a bunch of flyby dealers, right? Guys have gotten to this business in the last two years. And I, and I don't mean that in a negative way, right? I'm by calling them flyby dealers. I'm talking about new guys in the market all of a sudden that said, oh my God, I can make a ton of money here. I'm going to jump into this market and do it myself. And what happened? We have a lot of WhatsApp chats that go on in this world, probably thousands of different WhatsApp ch chats with thousands of dealers on there, where 70%, 60% of those dealers were just flippers that were selling to each other. What happens when dealers sell to each other and watches don't end up on risk prices tend to inflate. Now, if I'm a new dealer and I'm back here and I'm working the chats, I'm working the Facebook groups and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to sell this stainless steel Daytona wholesale for $55,000 with a white dial. Because I know that if I go to Asia, to the Asian chats, they're, they're paying more and therefore I'm going to hold price here. Because at any given time, I can sit, I can really, really flip it over to China, right? Oh, my God, China closed. Like he said, now we have an issue. And the issue is that they no longer have that safe heaven of flipping the stuff over to Asia. Now they're trying to sell the stuff to each other. Now there's a little bit of panic, especially among the new dealers. And all of a sudden, they don't want to buy because they're afraid because their money is tied in all this hype inventory that has gotten overly inflated. And we're talking about maybe 20, 30 different models, right? We're not talking about brands. We're not talking about, uh, you know, big as a whole. We're talking about specific models within the specific brands, i.e. your most popular stuff. Yes. So what we're seeing on the wholesale market is you've seen the new dealers panicking because they have a lot of money tied up because they were running this as if this was never going to end or there was not going to be a correction or stop, right? So now they're panicking like, holy shit, I got to pay my Amex bill at the end of the month because now I'm living a certain lifestyle that I need to afford. And then you have existing dealers and older dealers like us. What are we doing? We're not changing anything. We are still buying. We're still selling. On a wholesale end, I just came back from Vegas. We did over a million at one of the slowest shows of the yeah. year, right, in business, where a majority of the room, some of the newer guys, they weren't really selling because what did they have in their showcases? The hype, 
hype, hype stuff, stuff that has reached price levels that are ridiculous. Where what we always do here is we diversify our merchandise because majority of the market is not affected. So on the retail end, you're going to see prices drop on some of the hype stuff. So expect to, if you're selling something as a retail client, expect to get paid a little less. And at the same token, if you're buying something, why do I not see my countdown, by the way? Ian, do I not, do I not have a countdown? Now you started my countdown? <laughs> really? I have another 90 seconds oh, to talk yeah. about this? All right. So uh, in either case, I'm going to, I think it's been 90 seconds, but the bottom line is this, if, as a retail client, if you're somebody looking to sell something, expect prices to be about 20 to 30% lower only on the hype stuff. The rest of the stuff is still even key, right? It's not a market that got affected. It's certain models that got affected. On a wholesale level, if you're a dealer, if you're a need dealer, my advice to you is you continue buying. And if you're sitting on a few pieces on which you have to take a 10 to 20% loss, then that's what you do. However, what will the market bring? We'll talk about next. Well, actually, a few topics down, and we'll talk about in general where this market is going to go. Let's uh, put another countdown on the on the thing. You can start off with the annual wash report. Uh, and now uh, we're going to go to price corrections. Is an annual wash report, so we should probably follow suit. No, no, right here. Price corrections. Price corrections. We're still in the current market status. So let's talk about price correction on specific models. I'll let you. I'll let you go with this one. Ninety seconds go. Okay, guys. So obviously, there's a few. Like Roman mentioned earlier, there was a few. Reference numbers, call it 30, maybe 40, no more than 50 reference numbers that took the biggest hit. And those reference numbers were things like stainless steel Rolex sports models, Automar Spicay stainless steel sports models, Patek Philippe stainless steel sports models, and precious metals as well. I started to notice a trend actually right after December, right after the new year, a ridiculous, ridiculous spike in prices almost out of nowhere. I remember we had a conversation about a year ago on uh, watches and whiskey when we talked about the Panda specifically. Yeah, I lost that bet. And uh, it did go you lost the bet. I think it was. I think it was actually forty, not forty-five. Forty-five. We, forty-five. You, you bumped okay, it up so to forty-five. It went up over forty-five thousand. I thought that it was going to stabilize right there. The moment it, it hit fifty-five to sixty thousand, I was I was speaking to a friend of mine, also another dealer, and I said, "This is where this is where the correction happens." The fifty-five thousand dollar mark, I thought, was ridiculous for what the watch is. You got 15 seconds. No, because he's he's he's, wa he's waving like I'm up. No, he's so, not. You got 10 so seconds. So in a nutshell, a pan of Daytona that was at 55,000, a watch that's been out for six years, should not trade four or five X over retail. Well, on this list, we also have a 116508 green. Let's put another timer. We can talk about this. And again, the green Daytona, the highest I've seen it go up to is $155,000. Yeah, that was a fully With, sticker example. That fully sticker example. Uh, this is not a watch that should be $155,000. I think this watch was just fine hovering around that $100,000 mark. Where's it at right now? I mean, pending condition is between 100 to 125. To 125. So a good correction there. 126710 BLRO, which is the Pepsi. In what world is a Pepsi GMT trading a triple list? I'm sorry, that doesn't work for me. How about quadruple? Well, is it 90, yeah, 92, okay. 50? It went up to like 30, uh, low 30s. No, that's not a watch that should be trading that. Case in point, and it came down to mid 20s. Still ridiculous. Still almost three times the price, right? But. 30 is just outrageous. We got the Royal Oak 26631 SD. Those things just kind of shut up. I mean, a blue dial, where was it at? 110 it hit. Yeah, a blue dial hit 110. In what world does that happen? I'm sorry, that's way too much. Case in point is back down to what, about 70s, mid-70s? No, it's, it's, it's still hovering in the 80s and 90s. That's the blue dial. But yeah. then if you're talking about the white yeah. dials and stuff like that, where are those at? Uh, right now, also in the 60s, 70s, 60s 70s, yeah. 15202 SD. Yes, the 16202 came out. I get it. It was discontinued. Now you have the 16202, but still not a watch that should go up to $150,000. And last but not least, 5981R that went up to $300,000. I believe that was absolutely over 300. They, over they, 300. They I believe that's, that's really ridiculous because that's a watch that should have been. 200 there's no there's quarter. no again there's no there's no coulda woulda shoulda there's no shouldas it's just it just the, went up the, the velocity of the rate that it went up was unhealthy for the market as a whole exactly and uh things like the 57 11 steel things like the 57 11 57 11 r is the one that took the biggest beating because of exactly. the discontinuation exactly but also guys keep in mind around that time you had watches and wonders there was a lot of speculation on what's going to be discontinued it happens every year when people look at certain models coming out and they're like okay well this might be discontinued okay I'm going to buy up Platinum Daytonas. I'm going to buy up 5711 1Rs in case they do get discontinued. They go through the roof. It's a certain gamble that people took, and that also drove the prices up. Let's go to a good topic, and I'll start with this one if you don't mind. And that is the question of why is it happening? Uh, let's put another 90 seconds on the clock, and I'll be really quick about this. 
Adrian already touched upon it. I already touched upon it. And the main key word there was Asia, China, right? Uh, Shanghai population, 25 million people. Population of Hong Kong, almost 10 million people. But the best part is China luxury market share is about 21% worldwide of luxury right. goods. And out of that 21%, 49% is watches and jewelry, right? And that's a big number. So when you shut down a city like Shanghai, when you shut down a Hong Kong, which is a humongous hub, humongous hub, there's so the much hub. It's the hub, right? Yeah. It's the hub. It's it's think of uh think of the port of New York for trading goods, right? That's Hong Kong. But when you talk about luxury and you're talking about a region that makes up for one oh, more than one fifth of world's population's consumption of luxury goods, we're talking about what a sixty billion dollar industry last year, right? Yeah. Think about think of that in terms. What is that going to do to the market? Of course. And it's not because they don't want to buy. It's because they can't physically buy. When you shut down in your house and you literally can't leave, uh, you know, it's just it's it becomes impossible. Another thing, in my opinion, is the saturation of new coming dealers and the retail sector becoming the seller rather than the buyer. When you have a retail client out there whose only purpose is to go out there to his ID, uses all connections to buy a piece in order to make money rather than put it on his wrist and enjoy it. Those are my two cents. What are your thoughts? Uh, so the current market status is actually very funny because when people ask me about current market status, what they're really asking me is about the future market status. That's the number one question. But the question is, why is this happening? Besides yeah. besides Asia, because all the dealers, what can you add to as to why this is happening? I mean, let's let's uh, identify the elephant in the room. We're literally on for in some people's minds on the brink of World War Three in Russia and Ukraine. You know, you Correct. have you have just a psychological phenomena that people are going through right now. You know, as soon as, soon as the, the war broke out, you know, we had personal ties to people there and just changed the mood of people. Not to mention every day you turn on CNBC and you're talking about Powell raising interest rates and there's a recession coming and equities and securities markets are going on. Crypto market is going down. So people think that they're poor on paper. Therefore, they actually now want to turn their 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 luxury goods into cash. They want to hold cash right now because they're scared of, of what's to come. So, you know, I tell people all the time, in the, in this current market status right now is an opportunity to actually buy something at a reasonable price because all it takes is for china to open back up for prices to spike right back up so right now if you're buying buy what you like and buy value i think that is extremely extremely crucial and important is to purchase something of value which we're going to uh talk about later which brings us to our next question and that next question is should i wait for the prices to bottom out well you just heard what adrian said think COVID. When COVID hit, everybody took a shit. Like everybody got scared. Dealers included, myself included, agent included. Don't think where there was big badasses that didn't get scared when COVID hit and everything stopped for three months and prices crashed. About 20, 30%. What did they crash on? The hot models at the time. Of course, it may sound funny now. At the time, the 15202 was trading at about $45,000 and that was a high price, mm -hmm. right? It kind of hit its peak at oh, that well, time. Uh, 43, 42. It was kind of hit its peak at that time. But guess what? Everybody got scared. But then remember what happened three months later? Everything went through the roof. I'm not telling you everything is going to go through the roof in three months time. Or crash. But let's assume, let's assume the following. Let's assume China opens back up. God willing, and I pray to God, the war in Ukraine is over. And at the same token, you have inflation going at the same rate that it's going. You have to remember something. In the last year and a half, people have learned my countdown is not on hit. Ian, somebody go shoot Ian. Uh, uh, so you have to remember something. Uh, and I lost my chain of thought. So you gotta, you gotta deal with you this. Gotta, you, gotta you, gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do something with this countdown. Don't forget to we put need it a horn. There. We need a horn. Exactly. For next time. Is that what you just did? What was I going with this? Oh, you gotta remember in the last year and a half to two years, the general public, considering the amount of numbers and, and monies that have been in this business, the general public and the countdown is gone. We're going to fix this. I promise. I promise we will, fix it. we will fix it. Should I use my phone? Seriously? In the last year and a half to two years, people have gotten used to the idea, which, which is actually the opposite of what I've always said. I've always said watches are not an investment. They're an expensive toys. But right now, the general population believes and sees a proven record of watches over the last few years of how much money can be made or how liquid those things are and how much they can retain it. Right. So with the inflation going up and I'm somebody that's sitting on a ton of cash, which I've made over the last few years because every business has been booming. I may say to myself, perhaps it's not a bad hedge against investment. I mean, uh, against, against inflation, inflation. Right. So that's another fact that they can say. So to answer the question, I said, should I wait for prices to bottom out or not? I'm going to go back to the same thing. 
buy what you like first and foremost. In today's market, there is opportunity to go out there and get those hype pieces that you always wanted at about a 20 to 30 percent discount. And we don't know whether they're going to continue going down or once the events change over the next month or two, that it's going to spike back up. And usually when it spikes back up, what does it do? It goes over the previous numbers. Yeah, and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going gonna, to finish the segment with one, one final thought. Uh, people like to ask me all the time, how do you time things? You know, yeah, I have a lot of stock traders and day traders and crypto traders. How do you time things? They ask me. I said, I don't. It's impossible for me to know. I make decisions based on the current market value. I don't speculate. I don't think what's going to happen in the future. I don't think what, I don't think about what happened in the past. Today, I'm buying a watch for a value that I think I can sell for quickly. Now, mind you, Adrian, average purchase uh, is anywhere from two to three million dollars a week. And with the market slowdown, we did not see a decline in purchasing. There was some decline from the retail line, I believe, right? Because, you know, people were like a little shocked saying, oh, wait a minute, you were paying 28 for a Pepsi last week. Now you want to pay me 22. And they, but uh, you know, uh, funny enough, they come back. They come back because they're going to call bought. They're going to call around and people are actually scared about we're still yep. buying. So our buying has not dipped whatsoever, okay. as far as I'm concerned. Maybe a tiny little bit just because people are sort of like in a hold pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, things that... As usual, does that mean we're not buying Pepsi's 15202s or Paddock or Nautilus? We bought three Nautiluses last week. We bought three Aquanauts next week. So, again, you adjust to the market and you continue on. Some pieces are, are trading at, at a, at a, on a very straight line. They're exactly. not crashing daily. Let's talk about some stats, right? And what are stats in our business? It would be the annual watch report, right? And we're going to start with the fact that – oh, wait a minute. We got questions first. All right. Hold on a second. Uh now that we finished the current market setup, let's take some questions. Can you give some real world prices on AP Royal Oaks, please? So let's. I mean, that, 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 that's too vague. I mean, well, how about how about uh, let's do uh, let's do fifteen five hundred black, white, gray dial and blue. OK, so let's say I'm, I'm going to I'm going to use brand new examples. Yeah, because we can't we can't go. There's, use, there's use. too many. There's too many new nuances. But let's say brand new examples. Fifteen five hundred black, 80. Uh, the blue, whites, and grays are hovering in the in the in the mid to low six. Now, when you say prices, this is selling prices or buying? this is just let's just, just say average market price. Is what we're okay, selling gotcha. for. So you, you so blue is what? Blues blues around the eighty thousand mark, and the the black, white, uh, uh, black, white, and gray is in the low sixties. Uh, let's talk about uh, the chronos. Let's talk about blue chrono. Blue chrono, brand new, hovering at the ninety thousand mark. The the panda is hovering around the mid seventies, and the black one is a little bit under that. And if we're going to talk about Royal Oak, let's talk about perpetuals. Perpetuals are still up there. Uh, certain limited ones, wouldn't you say? Yeah, again, it, it comes it comes down to overall supply on the market. You know, for every Royal for for every one perpetual, they probably make you know twenty Royal Oaks. And a lot of the what about a lot of the Royal Oak perpetuals that are limited, like the Japan edition, the Canadian, the steel. They're 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 sold through the roof. You can't find them. You can't exactly. touch them. You know, stuff that you can't find, and that's what you know. I always said, you know, look for value out there. It's. Uh, if you have something that there's only 20 pieces made of, odds are it's not going to be susceptible to market conditions because with that, at that point, whoever has the watch based on what he paid and the margin that he wants to make, that's going to be always the price of the watch. Unless in some rare case, this guy really, really needs money. He's willing to dump it just to get out of it. But for the most part, people that hold those types of pieces are the ones that can afford to hold on to them. So those are going to stay steady and you think limited. Uh, another question. Assuming you could sell trade them, which three watches would you pick if you could only have those three from now on? If you couldn't sell trade them, which three watches would you pick if you could only have? You mean which which watches would I hold on to forever and never ever sell? That's a very tough question. Oh, uh, I'm gonna go. I'll give you one. Uh, uh, Fifty four oh two, uh, the original Royal Oak from Audemars Piguet from 1972. In stainless steel, that's a watch I would buy, hold on to, never sell a trade. You? This is almost like this is almost like a question about what's your favorite watch. Yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of like that. That's, yeah. I, don't, we, I don't know if it's from an investment standpoint. I mean, no, I, guess I, it depends I think it's what, what you pay for the watch. Let's 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 just, let's just say yeah. from a purpose of me just wanting to have that watch. I'll give you while you think about it. I'll give you another one. I would probably buy and sell an RM either zero zero four zero zero eight in rose gold a watch i would probably hold on to and never sell okay, well, and it, from paddock it would still be the sky moon kirby up for me well for me it would be an rm009 Good luck. that's it. It, it, <laughs> it it comes down to this it comes down to the things that i would hold is what's rare i got you let's go to another question what else do we have 
Do Jacobs depreciate and are paddocks still safe? The answer to that question is yes, they do. Dep again, depreciation from, let's say, if you're paying MSRP on the watch. Yes, they do. I would say the majority of them do. I don't really know of too many that go over retail, if that ever even happened. But yes, they do depreciate if you're paying MSRP. And if paddocks are still safe, um, yeah, if you're buying a watch, if you're buying any paddock called Nautilus or Aquanaut or some special edition uh, Grand Complication, absolutely you're safe. I mean, those watches will never be let's, traded. Let's, I'll again. answer this question long term, right? So you have, let's talk about Jacob first, right? Jacob has come a long way from the quartz five time zone watches that he's made. I have a lot of appreciation for Jacob, the man himself, what he's done with the company, what he's taken the company. I have a lot of appreciation for some of the high horology pieces that have been making over the last three years. Incredible. So let's just say Jacob has gone a long way to a watch being virtually virtu uh, worthless when you took it off your list to something that actually has a steady value in the market and something and something that will, yes, it may not, if you buy it at list, you will still lose money, but you have to consider the fact of how much money you would lose on the watch. And if you asked me that question five, 10 years ago, I would tell you, you would pretty much lose your entire investment where today there's still a value left in that watch, especially on some of the cool limited stuff. That, I mean, his new Bugatti watches, it's just, they're mind blowing. Astronomy right? is. Astronomy is a mind blowing. There's a lot of things that he does well. So Jacob has come a long way and I think he has a big future ahead of him as long as he continues the path that he has chosen in terms of super rare, high horology and high jewelry watches that he's been making. Uh, and a paddock still safe. Paddock has always been safe. Paddock is the Rolls Royce of the watch world if you don't count Rolex. So overall, in the long term, you cannot go wrong with a paddock. Uh, any more questions or we're going to our next topic? I guess we got another one. Our FP Jorn good investment versus paddock. I have FP Jorn Chronometra Blue and uh, go, Octo buddy. Sport. Oh, look at there that. Is. Adrian is wearing the Chronometra yeah. Blue. I'll take that one and I'll tell you very, very simple. Don't compare Jorn to paddock. Paddock is paddock. Jorn is an independent that makes very, very low production numbers of watches. Yes, it seemingly seems to be a great investment considering every Jorn is out there trading through the roof, but that's due to the limitation of product, the availability to the end consumer because uh, a a person that's approved and it's on a list to receive stuff from Epijon can only get two pieces a year. And that pool is extremely small due to the amount of pieces that they make. So you can't compare an independent that's such a small production to a monster like Paddock has been around for such a long time. Epijon is not that old. Again, right? it's, it's too vague of a question. You have to it, compare specific models and what you paid for them. And one thing to keep in mind is when you buy something that's super rare from an independent that has a very, very small production yearly, the market on that product, let's call it apples and oranges. So if, if Epijon is apples and you only have so many apples being produced, if you have 10 apples being produced versus 5,000 apples being produced, think about the market size for that particular product. And rule of thumb is the bigger the market size, the more uh, value there is behind that product, the more trading that goes on. When you're talking about Epijon, it's a very, very small pro uh, market and the trading that takes place with that is so small that sometimes it can actually be a negative. Right now it's a big positive, but at some point it can turn into a negative where paddock is big, steady, and it just continues have, on, it'll continue yeah, on. I have one, one final point to touch on in this regard. It's hard to compare the two brands, A, due to the supply, but I will say this. If FP Jorn produced the amount of watch that paddock produced, there's no way they'd be where they are today. And that's the bottom Guys, line. The watch he's wearing right now, not so many years ago is a watch I've owned as cheap as eighteen to nineteen thousand dollars and nobody gave a shit, right? So again, certain powers that be, certain marketing techniques, certain people that got behind them, i.e. our friends over at Watchbox blew the brand up and rightfully so. Do I think it's worth it? Absolutely. There are Values wonderful the watch, watches. Absolutely, is but... the watch making that better than of paddock? I'll also go out on a limb and say that. Maybe. But paddock is still paddock, right? And it is what it is. Uh we're gonna go to some stats. And our stats in our world are the annual watch report. So, obviously, no surprise, Rolex remains the leader among Swiss watch brands, 29% of the market, market share. share. Holy shit, that's $20 billion. Yeah. Th just th think about that. Uh, and uh, they're, well, they're saying estimated turnover of CHF $8 billion in 2021. But if mm -hmm. you look at the numbers going back a year from now, it's probably closer to 20 because, again, we're looking at 2021 numbers. Uh, one of the things that... Uh, uh, the fact that Rolex is leading is not a surprise. I've told you guys numerous times, uh, you can be in a desert dying of thirst and have no food uh, in the middle of nowhere. And if you have a Rolex on your wrist, you could probably buy 10 camels and <laughs> 10 wives to go along with it because Rolex is so recognizable, so big. They're everywhere. Rolex is sponsoring F1. 
I'm guaranteeing you if you're in Dubai and you have an RM, you'll do the same. <laughs> Pro pro probably, but guess what? If I took 100 people that with average knowledge of watches and I put five different brands, top brands, Paddock, Rolex, Omega, uh, uh, Audemars Piguet, Richard Mille, the most recognizable watch on that table Absolutely. is still going to be a Rolex, so it's no surprise. Rolex has set himself in the market where I believe there's no other brand in the world will ever reach them, will ever outrun them, or even get close. What do you think? From a from a I still watch got eight, I still got eighteen seconds. From, you can, from you can, a watch standpoint, yes. Oh, absolutely. From a never, brand never, standpoint, never. It's never. never gonna happen. It's the crown. Hmm. They are the king. They have the crown, and I'll agree with that. Anything else for you to add on Rolex? Rolex is king. That's all I got. Rolex is Next. king. Which favorite Rolex? Oh, you gotta do that to me again. <laughs> it's a tough one. I, I can't. I can't choose. Don't give it's me. Going a, to, don't give me a particular one. It's, it's, Daytona, it's, it's, Submariner, GMT. Oh, Daytona for sure. See, I, 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 I for me, it's a toss up. For me, it's uh, Daytona or sub, right? Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the next topic, and that is how the brands are standing in the market. Big, big surprise in 2021, and that is, look, it was always Rolex, it was always Omega, uh, and then you had all the other brands. Paddock was there. Oh, AP jumped over Paddock. No, let's talk about the fact that Omega, uh, that Cartier jumped over Omega. That Omega was always that second one. It was Rolex and Omega, Rolex and Omega, Rolex and Omega, and now Cartier took over. How they did that, I have no idea, but yes. I'll tell you Cartier. exactly how, how. The Santos models. 47th Street again, started icing them out. Same thing that happened in Paddock five years ago. That is so, I that swear. Is so true. I swear the it's Santos funny, just, just exploded. Skeletons, the blue dials, the white dials, it does, didn't matter. I got more demand for, for Santos than I ever did before. I'm like, what the hell is this? Where did this come from? There you go. So uh, what he's talking about, and I talked about and a Cartier crash. We, 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 well, obviously, we talked about this in the last. Uh, we talked about this in the last watches and whiskey, where I said, you know, what actually gave the last kickstart to the fifty nine eighty models when they were trading at around thirty eight thousand, thirty five thousand models in general, and not those models in general was actually guys started to ice them out, yep. and then it kind of went through the roof. Uh, so let's talk about the next surprise, I, and I guess uh, uh, Audemars beats Paddock. Yep. that's insanity. If you think about production numbers, and you think about uh, you know Paddock versus AP, think about R the Rolls Royce of the watch world getting beat out by a brand uh, like Audemars Piguet. That's music to my ear. Audemars Piguet is my absolute favorite brand. Big shout out to Francois, who is a genius who started off running Audemars Piguet in North America or the Americas, then moved on to be a global CEO. I think that man along with Roman Scharf in the gray market, are solely responsible <laughs> for the fact that Audemars Piguet is where they are today. Hats off to them. A big, big congratulations because yes. that's a big feat. Mind you, we, we're talking about Audemars beating Patek Philippe. How about Longines? Longines was hovering two, three spot all the time. Again, a brand that we often don't talk yeah, about. Sort of that point. lower end price, price point, point brand. But guess what? They were always up there in terms of sales. So besides beating out Patek Philippe, you got... They beat out long jeans, which is a huge, huge to do. Mm -hmm. And look, in terms of numbers, you know, if things continue going the way they're going, they're not too far taking the number three spot, if you will. Yeah. I mean, very close. Again, a, a far, a far cry from number one, but definitely, uh, what do you call it? Let's let's go. Uh, what's our next topic here? Top four brands mm -hmm. account for forty-one percent of sales and sixty-two percent margins. And I'm going to read this to you guys. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, where's that graph? Here it is. So Rolex, Audemars Piguet, Paddock, Richard Mille achieve returns that few luxury brands can match. So now we're talking about not only the top four brands, which again, Rolex, not only not only the top four brands, but we're talking about brands that are also accounting for 62% of margin. So it's between now, it's no surprise that Richard Mill is here because Richard Mill has the highest markup on their watch. Yes. I think it's 12 and a half times is what they make, right? But if you look at the fact that Rolex, well, Rolex is no surprise that Audemars Piguet is in there along with Richard Mille, and those are the guys that account, account for 62% of the profit, that's amazing. We also have to keep in mind, but in regards to profit margin, we've seen brands like Audemars Piguet, Paddock, and Richard Mille, they took the Audemars Piguet model of becoming boutique only. Mm -hmm. So their production to the wrist, and plus the retail price point. I think they raised retail prices on AP, Richard Mille, three times over the pandemic. So yeah. there you go. Uh, here's another thing that's worth mentioning, and this is the information that we're giving you guys, some of the stuff you can obviously find online, but why are we telling you this information? And 
if you know that you have four companies, again, in this case, Rolex, Automar, Paddock, and Richard Meal, that make up, make up 62% of the profit made in the industry, ask yourself, well, where am I putting my money, right? And that's really what it comes down to. That's a, it's an indication as to the future of the brands and so on and so forth. And the biggest thing everybody talks about is, for years, Richard Mill is a flop. Richard Mill is a flop. Richard Mill is a flop. It's going to crash and burn. Guess what? In this last price correction, guess the one brand that didn't correct. One brand. Richard Mill. He shot. Did not correct. Supply and demand. Super complicated, super innovative timepieces that they've made. The brand did not flop. And they trade some of the pieces trade five, ten, five, some, some things ten, trade. Is a, with the new, um, the new Nadal, 3503. Yeah. Million dollar million watch. dollar watch that retails for how much? No, there's no turbine on it. Yeah, uh, one hundred eighty thousand dollars. <laughs> who, who can do that? I do want to touch upon independence, right? Experience phenomenal growth. Now, if I look at the statistics, you know they make up of about, you know, one percent of Swiss exports, maybe, right? Their volume is less than a percent. But I've always told you guys to keep an eye on independence because the growth that I'm seeing independence again. I'm going to take Jorn out of the equation. And even with their tremendous growth, it's obviously that, uh, you know, they're probably making up a lot for that growth in terms of value. But if you look at strictly Swiss exports and what it compares to to the big graph we had on the screen earlier, it's less than a percent. But FB Journe solidified itself. Brands to keep an eye on. Told you before. MBNF. Erberg. Uh, Grubel Forze. Grubel Forze is another one that is sort of, I don't know if you saw, uh, actually didn't see it yet. When you see the Vegas video, I show a very special uh, Grubel Forze next week. The stuff that they've done with their watches is amazing. They realize that they can't continue carrying the higher retail prices, five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars $900,000. And they sort of come down to earth with their retail pricing, sportified a lot of their watches, made them a lot more wearable because the Grubel Forze tend to be bigger. I always say, Pound for pound, the best. The best. No, 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 nobody, there. nobody comes. Even, even your Zorn. If you go back, if you go, compare. if you go back five years and you look at this numbers, and if I told you it makes up one percent of the Swiss export, I'll tell you right now, five to ten years ago, they weren't even on a map. They're steadily growing. Mm. The value is there. Look out for those. Anything you want to sell on independent? Did you mention Debithune? Uh, Debithune. Yes, there's another one. I'm sorry, I did not. I have come to have a much higher appreciation for independence over the past year. Because the value, I think value, price. Yeah, you're wearing one. Yeah, price, price. No, this is a Jorn. Well, Still yeah, independent. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> true. We don't even, it's funny how when Jorn blew up to a point where we often forget. Yeah, that, I forget it's, it's, independent, independent, yeah. it's an independent yeah. brand, right? And yep. a small brand at that. Yeah. Uh, if you had to pick a watch or pick a brand independence, where, would, where what would be on your wrist? Oh, man, that's, that's a tough one. Besides I will say, I, I will say Jorn. Even though MBNF and their Legacy Machine Professional is my favorite watch of all the independent brands in the lineup, but the amount of different variations and styles of Jorns versus any of the other independents, I think, blows them out of the water. Because there's only a few MBNFs that I actually really like. I love them all. Yeah, the, it's the, the craziest the Jorns, ones. I love them all. The Jorns are. I uh, if I, I you know what to be fair, I'll go across the new uh, GMT from FB Jorn. I mean from Grubel Force. Oh, yeah, yeah, on a yeah, bracelet yeah, is insane. Grubel, yeah. Uh, for yep. MBNF, got to go with the LM Perpetual, oh, just the same. Uh, probably my favorite watch. FB Journe, I am going to go with uh, the new Vertical Turbia that vertical. we saw in the video in LA. That watch is absolutely the bonkers. Black labels, the, the Black Label Vertical Turbia is absolutely the insane. Uh, Dibithune would be... Uh, what's I like the, the Sky Chart. The Sky Chart. Yeah. And the Sky Chart from Dibithune is amazing. Erwerk always had a tough time picking a particular Erwerk. Yeah. I How about this? I haven't met an Erwerk I didn't like. I like them all. Like honestly, like you give me any artwork. I mean, the T Rex is a little big on me, like the one we have. But <laughs> I, I, I've yet to know. Artwork is very acquired I, I, taste. I, 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 I really didn't very, like. Very I'm not a taste. big fan of the planer stuff, the Laurent Ferrier, the the, the Moser stuff. It's right. a little too plain for my taste. Yeah. Although I do understand the appeal in those watches, but I would rather have something a little crazier, like an I NBA. unfortunately do not. But. Uh, okay, let's take some questions. Do you have a view on a long and son future values, please? Ooh, ooh can I take them? Oh, go ahead. You go, you go first. 90 seconds. You go first. Uh, Lange and son. So, again, it's one of those brands that you can pair with the paddocks of the world, the FB Jorns, in terms of craftsmanship, engineering, and overall quality of the watch. I think that the best thing that they have done 
probably ever is introduced to Odysseus models. Because what does that do for the brand? It gives them leverage to sell the more unsellable stuff better than ever before. Well, and they enter the sports market. They enter the sports market. By entering the sports market, it has caused their other pieces to go up. However, I still find it a little bit more difficult than I should to sell a Lange. There's still a little bit of trigger shyness, if you will, on purchasing them. And I don't know. I can't really put my finger as to why such a small amount of their catalog trades at a premium. Dress brand versus okay, but okay, brand. but you can you see, look at Paddocks, look at Jorns, of the like. You know, it's it, it's missing that something. They make you know their site works and their, their all their lumens and and they're I actually love the Odysseus by the way. I love the unbelievable Odysseus. watch. I slept on a white gold one and I, I and I really really liked it once we started. But getting anything mid tier still sells at a pretty substantial discount on their list. Uh, so rather than repeating more of what you just said, I'll tell you this. Let's start a new countdown. Give me 90 seconds now. And rather than, uh, I'll just give you, I'll just put a spit fact. Kids, is that how, is that the common term now? Spitting facts, right? So I'm going to yeah. spit some facts. Uh, Audemars Piguet, Richard Mille, FB Jordan. You got all these brands that are trading through the roof on the secondary market. They're watching and the rich man goes, goes, holy shit. Why are these guys doing this? And we're the big badass Richmond group and we can't do this. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? They say, okay, we're going to do the same thing. We're not going to reinvent the wheel because they all follow each other. We're going to do exactly what Francois invented. We're going to cut production. They went from five to 6,000 pieces a year to 2,000 pieces a year. They invent, They did the, the list where they you have to sign up. Uh, you have to be approved. There's a waiting list. Allocation, the process. allocation process. They put that into place. By cutting production by 2,000 to 2,000 pieces, they extremely, extremely lower the supply and what i what did i see happen the pieces that you were talking about that still sell at a discount you're now seeing that discount being a lot less so and richmond group is following in the suit of what Audemars Piguet laid out along with francois and they're doing exactly the same thing so what do i think the future and the values are i'm going to put a big buy 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 on a uh, longer <laughs> and what do i buy you buy the older discontinued models you buy the limited editions you buy the zeitwerks you do you buy what you like first and foremost, <laughs> but the bottom line is if this was a stock market desk, I would put a big buy and a big up arrow on Long It is general. for sure the most undervalued brand out there. 100%. That, that, next next, next question. Uh, from, uh, I keep forgetting from to read who the questions are from. Four, I guess it's on the screen. You guys can Four see Four nine's it. fine. How does your business operation adapt to changes in the watch market? How do you, how do you sell watches when prices have decreased? Uh, I guess I'll take this one. Go ahead. It's a, it's, a, it's a very very interesting question because for the for the past two years we have seen things on an upward tra trajectory and granted it's always easier to sell things upwards because a there's more demand in the market b people have FOMO of missing out hey if I don't buy this now and if I wait a little bit the price is going to be up so right now we're actually in almost like a, a not a rebranding phase but we're, we're we're trying to figure it out as time goes on and our there's been a couple clients that contact me that i haven't heard from in a while to buy watches now because they're like hey you know i can almost own a pepsi now a pepsi and a half now for what i for what it was a month ago right so so they're seeing the value and our month for the month of of april was pretty strong it was a very strong month considering it was a tax month now, april is usually yeah. slower because it's tax season but we had a very strong month in the month of april actually uh if you will. Yeah. So the most difficult part about what's going on right now is our buying program, buying from the public, because people are a little bit hesitant to, to sell for what they feel is lower, lower price than usual. They still look at Chrono 24, even though Chrono 24 prices are slowly starting. But that's always been a problem. Uh, I mean, I'll add a few things to this. I don't need a countdown, but uh, you, you, the answer is in your question. Uh, how does your business operation adapt to change? That's exactly what we do. We adapt to changes yeah. and we adapt on them hourly, daily, weekly, we continue going where the market goes. Yes, sometimes we can be the market setter, but for the most part, we watch the market carefully. And we just true, try to do what we do best, and that is to bring value to a client, whether it's on a selling end, on a buying end, with being fair, making a fair margin, and continue utilizing you know, our existing pool of clients of 20 years to continue doing business as usual. Nothing has stopped. We didn't stop buying. We didn't stop selling. So, and we do exactly what you said in the question. We simply adapt to the situation at hand. Any more questions or do we go to the next topic? Next topic, next topic is going, no, never mind. What is your thoughts on Rolex Sprite GMT Master 2? Not a fan. Not a fan. I just, I, I, I don't get like the why. No, nobody can answer to me the why. 
what what was the purpose of that? Sure, your right handed watch wears the triggers on the other side, but the, why? I don't know why. So that the public can go apeshit because they know damn well what I saw. People, I, I people saw ask me about collect- Jubilee one sold yesterday for forty six thousand. By the way, how, how about actually more than more than I project? So there you go. Watch mark is down, but you know, a, a right ugly. I'll tell. I'll tell. I'll tell. For, I, I, I can you know. give. I can give you the why. I can give you the why. And the why is very simple. I'll make this short and sweet, and we'll move on, move on to the next topic. The why is very short and sweet. It's not, by the when way, people, it's not a sprite. It's a Sierra Mist. Go ahead. Not a Celsius. I, no, I coined it the Sierra Mist. <laughs> all right. So the Sierra Mist. <laughs> People ask me this question all the time, especially when it comes to vintage Neo, vintage Rolexes, some older Rolexes, or even some of the newer Rolexes. And they say, hey, how do I pick out something that's going to be stand out in a collectible, in a sea of these collectible Rolexes where uh, I know that this is going to be the one? Well, you look at something that they make less. Rolex makes hundreds of thousands of watches. They did before and they're doing it million. now. Millions of watches, right? So you, 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 it's it's kind of well. How do I know this is going to be the collectible? Well, consider the fact of how many lefty Rolexes are they going to make versus the righty Rolexes. So that's why this is this is people are looking at this guy as a great investment as a uber collectible, but you still don't know if Rolex doesn't spit out half a million of them. But odds are, common sense will tell you that the lefty Rolexes are going to make a lot less of, and that's Absolutely. the why. It's creating that modern collectible. Actually, very, I never really looked at it. Creating like a that. modern collectible. Uh, we're going to go to the next topic, and that is market forecast. This is what I'm sure you guys want to hear. And the first topic, subtopic of market forecast is going to be where is the market going? We kind of touched upon this, and I'll go into this one right away. But uh, in 90 seconds or less, I can tell you this. Again, look at what's going on in the world. Mm-hmm. Current conditions, you know, a terrible, terrible war in the market. Inflation in the United States. Uh, we're talking about the Chinese market shutting down, something that makes up half or 20 20 percent of the entire world market now the question comes is i can never look into the future i can look into the past when we're talking about inflation odds are the stock market is going to go down when the stock market goes down the luxury market goes down people lose the mood to buy but never before have we had this phenom of luxury goods i.e watches becoming that true true asset class yep and so we don't really know whether the normal you know cyclical economies that we see look based on all the economic uh, indicators we're supposed to be in a, in a recession by 2024 rates are going up stock market is going to go down yes we're going to see all those traditional things but nothing has been traditional in the last few years we had a stock market at its all-time high and gold was at its all-time high where it's usually the opposite right gold is still going up it's very very tough to predict where this market is going, but I will tell you there will still be surprises. And my gut feeling is we're going to stabilize and we actually may see another jump. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned this earlier that there was a pretty significant price decrease over the past couple of weeks, but I monitor the market very carefully. I mean, that that that's exactly, in a sense, what I do. I'm an analyst, so to speak, right? So I, th- I see things trading on a very straight line. Mr. It's, analyst. Mr. Analyst. So things are going sideways. They're not really going down anymore. I still see big, big, big numbers being asked in the groups, even for things that have for stainless steel sports models that there's millions of them out there. They're still very, very high in relation to where they were. Now, a Pepsi, a Pepsi or a Batgirl or Daytona will never trade at retail again. It's just not going to happen. And if it does, we have bigger things to worry about than than the watch market. Right. That means that the, the globe is in the complete depression. Exactly. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll use up some of your 30 seconds as to where where this market is going. You have to consider the amount of money that's in this market today, both on the gray market end, the authorized end, and the end user end. There's Too much a, money. There's a lot of money invested Too into much. this market. So it's not like anybody magically say, oh, screw it. Let's go dump everything, and the market is going to take a complete crash. It's yeah. like it's like saying the stock market is going to go completely down. During COVID, the market went down a lot and popped back up. But guess what? With the amount of money that's in here, with the amount of people that have vested into this market today and really considering this a true <clears> asset, <throat> This market is not going to see some crazy ass crash. Just a few corrections here and there, and I think you're going to be seeing this fall down. Yeah, I, mean, I think watches are a fantastic store of value. So. The next subtopic is specific brands. Any forecast on specific brands from you, Adrian? Again, we just keep covering the same topic. I think that the money should be put into things like the Richard, if you can afford it, of course. Depending on what you can afford, value, 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 and things that don't have a large supply supply of. That's so in regards to specific brands, RM, certain APs to look out for stuff that's discontinued. 39 millimeter stuff, I think, is still undervalued. And uh, Rolexes, gold Daytonas, one 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 six five two eight models, right? That are 
pretty much on, on par with stainless steel current models uh pandas or even black tones value 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 those pieces didn't uh didn't go up at the same rate as as the more modern stuff but but in, in other words, it's much safer to invest in them because things that go up at a, such a high pace are the first things that come down. At a high pace. At a high pace. It's funny when the, those Royal Oak models, they jumped up, uh, you know, 30, uh, 20 to 30 percent in a matter of two weeks because, because of some hype in Asia. Yeah. Those are the ones that literally jumped down the same amount of money. They didn't go down more than they jumped, they jumped up. When the blue uh, Royal Oak Corona went up to 110,000 from 85 in a matter of two weeks, it went down just the same. Oh, yeah. Blue Royal, I'll, I'll tell them a story very quickly that, that's very funny. Right before New Year's, I bought a Blue Royal Oak Corona. And I'll be transparent because this is what the market was at the time. I paid $60,000 for it, which is more or less what the market was. I was going to pay sixty. dollars my head, I was selling oh, that's for the one that took two weeks to get here? No, 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 that wasn't the one. So in my head, I was going to sell for sixty six, sixty seven thousand, which is a proper margin for us to make. New Year's came along, and uh, somebody on the chats was looking for, for the watch. Somebody said 100000 for some reason, they dried up. Somebody said 100000 Guess what? That offer out there, whether he was joking or not, set the trend. Yeah. One guy, yeah. like 100000 because he was actually quoting somebody he didn't like. I ended up selling the watch for, for 88000 Which now seems cheap. Well, a month later, seemed really, really cheap. Give me 90 seconds to talk about this. Uh, specific brands. Uh, listen, you just heard us talk about, or you saw the graph of the top brands out there. AP, Richard Mille, Omega, Rolex, right? Uh, Paddock, all those are the brands have always been done well. Listen, you obviously go for the winners, but it's what you buy within those brands. There's so much value in going backwards. And I've talked about this a lot. And I'm not talking about vintage. Vintage is a separate topic. Vintage has always had a particular value on good examples of a particular watch. But if you start going backwards and you look at the brands that are coming up, i.e. the independents, you go back and you buy some of the MBN after been discontinued a longer round. That's value. You go back to Audemars Piguet. Audemars Piguet has made a ton of limited editions back in the day. Right. You go back and you look at those limited editions and you only have to go back five, 10, maybe 15 years, which is still a modern look, a modern watch. But watch that cannot be found. You go back to a paddock. You look at models that have been discontinued. Look at some of their dressier stuff. At the end of the day, paddock is still major. It's not a sports brand. It's a dressy brand. Mm -hmm. Look at the annual calendars, perpetual calendars. Look at their higher complicated lines out there that are trading at virtually no money at a third or a fifth of the cost of a stainless steel sports model you find value there. So you go to the major brands, you go to the stuff that's older, that's been discontinued, stuff that you can no longer get or no longer will be produced. And that's where you're gonna find your value. Mm. Draft picks. Uh, so the draft picks, by the way, we're gonna take questions first. Yeah. Uh, somebody put up a question, please. Gary, hey Gary. Gary is our fireman from that I shout met. Shout out at, Gary. That I met at the London show in person. Uh, shout out to Gary. Uh, just got in. How are you doing, guys? Looking forward to going back and seeing what's been said. What is the strangest thing you have taken in part exchange for a watch? Uh, remember the two puppies somebody sent? No, I'm just joking. Oh, <laughs> nobody sent, nobody sent a two puppies. That's a good one. I have one, but go ahead. Um, How about think, go, go strange things we've been offered, not oh. necessarily took in? We've done bag trades. So Anna, dad, that's my, Anna. Anna is the queen of that. She has she has lady clients that sometimes will trade in uh, certain uh, high end bags, Hermes bags, or uh, Chanel um, bags, and things like that. And those usually end up with the girls that work here at Love. There was Resort. almost a very, very, very uh, almost happened to trade for inventory in my father's uh, Miami condo. That was a good one. Yeah. So we, um, uh, his father. Put up his old condo up for sale and i think we almost made a trade for watches condo yeah. for watches yeah. that was one uh cars 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 is, cars, is cars is, is a good one we always get offered cars in trade and we do that because we have plenty of huh. friends in a car business oftentimes it doesn't work out because because we're not in that business we're simply going to call somebody and say hey uh this is the car being offered and the guy will say i'll pay this and oftentimes that's a price that someone can find out there already or maybe even slightly higher so mm -hmm. if we were in that business probably a little bit different but for, for the most part, uh, you know, I haven't been offered a firstborn yet, <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if I did. Gary, thanks so much for your question. Good to see you on the live. Let's go to the next question. I purchased a Starbucks at gray market value, 17000 Should I be worried and sell? No, keep it. Hold what, it. what did you just pay for one? Uh, it's, it's, so I'm, I'm paying 19000 for them new. 
So if we're paying nineteen thousand and we want to make a ten percent margin in the very least, do the math what the market value should Again, be. Again, these 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 questions are they they are very specific to your needs. You know, if you don't need the money, then don't sell it. It's it's a good price. In other words, you're not going to find this watch today for under seventeen thousand. Yeah, if you sell it today and you want to go back and buy it tomorrow, you, you're gonna you won't more. be able to. I think the part where you know it's like the stock market. The part where the market sort of takes a dip. Like there's a lot of people that day trade, be it crypto, be it stocks, yeah. whatever it might be, or commodities. Uh, you know. A month ago would have been a good time to, if you had a, sitting on a bunch of Rolexes a month ago, a month and a half ago, would have been a good time to sell it all and now buy all back. The hyper models are 20 to 30% yeah. less, right? But you already missed that. I don't think you're going to be able to capitalize on buying, selling, selling something, taking a small profit, and then buying it back later. The people that got greedy are the ones that are suffering the most. And I yeah. told them before, I said, if you're ready to sell, sell. If not, I'm, I'm not giving you any financial advice of where the prices are going to be going. I said, here's my offer now. And guess what? They came back to me. And my, sold and, and sold much, stuff a little bit much less. cheaper. Yep. Exactly. But again, this isn't a vindictive thing from us. This is just how we do business because when the market is fluctuating, we have to deal with it today and today only, which is why often I a lot of the deals I tell them my offer is good for 24 hours. And I do that even in the market that's rising or falling. Next question. Uh Oliver says thoughts on Rolex 16570 Sleeper Explorer 2. Adrian. I ride I'm a big fan of the polar. I think it's a great looking watch i think i think the value proposition is there you know it's much cheaper than a current 216 or 226 reference i think so in terms of value proposition is there i'm just so you can still pick them up under 10 grand you know yeah, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just going to say i'm going to go back to what i said earlier and say if you go backwards and you find that value whether it be to the fact that they made a lot less of something or the fact that the price is just there in comparison to the current market it's always a good bad so i'm going to say yes any more questions or are we going to the next topic? We have another question. Uh, Derek says, do you think famous people have huge influence on the watch market? The biggest influence. Of course. It is by Look far. What? I There was, so so the Oysterflex Daytona craze that happened right after New Year's. And I kind of figured out why it happened. That was actually the first model that I saw just explode to ridiculous proportions. And I and I asked somebody in Asia, I'm like, why did this happen? Well, apparently there was a celebrity that wore it a yellow gold champagne dial to an award show or something and then all of a sudden you just saw a huge trajectory of prices going up on the oyster flexi tones yes celebrities influence things a lot can we i see kevin hart or mark Wahlberg wearing a watch i immediately want it and i'm a watch dealer i, I, don't I will 100 as a agree. matter of fact i'm gonna I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off here if you notice what they What's did still with, your time if you notice what they did with the 5711 tiffany's not not tiffany stamp that the the, 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 the the tiffany so they made 170 examples of them, right? And if you saw on social media, who's wearing it? First, you saw LeBron. LeBron, Mark Wahlberg, um, and a few other celebrities. I forget off the top of my head. You didn't see any. There, there was one end, one or two end users. No, it was one end user that bought at auction. Yeah, and then Zach all attack. celebrities. So they released them to the celebrities first. So there's your answer. I'm going to give you one more on this topic, and I'm going to say look at Richard Neal. Mm -hmm. Part of the biggest success of Richard, never mind that they made something so different, so avant-garde, and they shocked the world with the pricing. Look at the amount of sponsors that they have and what kind of sponsors they have and who wears their watches. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's going to be every other car is going to have Richard Mille slapped on it at F1 this yep. weekend. Uh, so you have you have a lot of a lot of success. And is it really about celebrity or is it really about exposure, right? Both. You have to think about the fact of it's the exposure to come alongside with a particular celebrity that makes people say, oh, my God, I really, really want that. Right. Let's bring it down to a micro level. Neither you or me are celebrities. But think about you're not. How, no. Think about the amount of screen time we get and the amount of people to get to watch us on a weekly, daily, monthly basis that we do in a way also are able to influence people by you wearing that FB Jordan, by me wearing this Royal Oak Perpetual. It's it's one of those things where any amount of exposure out there on a product by someone that's being followed in one way, shape, or form, and especially in today's world of social media, is going to be a humongous success, which is why you're seeing a lot of brands following suit. Tom Brady, IWC. There's one right? There's one way to, that sum, costs up, there's a bit. One way to sum up this whole conversation. Roman Sharp is a celebrity. A yellow gold green dial Daytona. Thank you. Became a John Mayer after his Hodinkee interview. That's the bottom line. It went from a twenty-eight thousand dollars watch to now a hundred thirty thousand dollars watch. It went up a hundred grand, a hundred percent right. Any more questions or next topic? Oh wait, there we do. We do. Do you think famous people? Now that's the same question. <laughs> so are we going to the next topic, or are we taking another question? Anyone? Bueller. Bueller. 
now i have a question thoughts on swatch switching to selling in store only for the mega x swatch collaboration versus what online well because they saw the hype it's, yeah. it's pretty obvious that that's sure. what they want look at the end of the day where's the value in it in my business what is my biggest value in my business it's the client my biggest value in my business is the client so yes when you sell stuff online you do gain that client but when you get that client to walk into a store and outside of looking for the Omega watch, looking at all your other products, there's a bigger value there. Somebody goes onto my website and looks at a few watches and picks a particular watch is a lot different than somebody walking into my office, sitting downstairs with one of my sales guys being shown 30, 40, 100 watches, right? You get to show, you get to lift the actual curtain. The physical interaction is much better. A salesperson gains a client on a personal level. There's a big upside to selling in person versus just selling online. Part of the reason why we went with gray market, we opened up the curtains and show you guys, you know, what we do here. You know, every person that works in my, well, just about every person that works in my office. When you pick up the phone and call the office and you're talking to Alex, you can visualize Alex because you've been watching him a little bit. And again, that's the benefit. The in-person interaction with a client face to face makes it a lot more personable and makes that client, odds are that client coming back makes it, makes the, makes the odds of that client coming back a lot higher. Uh, what are we doing now? Oh, we got a super chat for forty nine ninety nine from our yo. It's Mike, our unplug. <laughs> Shout out to Mike. Mike, uh, thanks for being on a live. I appreciate it. You guys remember Mike? We ran into him in L.A. and I called an Uber and he showed up in a Porsche to pick me up. That was awesome. So Mike, I our unplug obviously asked the obvious questions because that's a big specialty of his. He's been selling Richard meals for quite a while and he's done extremely well with them. And I think we touched upon this. To answer your question, Mike, you saw the dip in the market. You don't just sell richer meals. You know this. You saw the dip in the market, the hyper the hyper just took that 20 to 30% dip, right? And kind of stabilized. Did richer meal do that? Absolutely not. Richard Mill is the only brand that was not Richard, affected. Richard saw the correction. Uh, it's, it's been about a nine month pause on the prices on Richard really, really increasingly going up. So right now it's stable and on certain models, 1103s, 3502s, just to name a few, Prices are higher than some. Sometimes even no, they are higher than I have ever seen them before. Because all they had to do was close the pipe. That's it. I'm not. That's, and that's I don't literally. Wanna, it's, it's, it's literally that. The people at the helm at Richard Meals are so smart, and I think they're the only brand out there that keeps the biggest eye out on the secondary the market. They're so in tune. They're so in tune with what the pricing is on a secondary market. They know exactly what and when to release and at what time. Yeah. And the reason for that is. And that's why you've seen such a success between RM. And I know, Mike, you got a lot of richer meals that you're sitting on. I would not worry for a second. Future is bright, my the friend. The future is bright. Supply and demand is they're the biggest user of supply and demand. And that's Five really four. it. All right, we're going to go to what? Next topic draft, draft picks. Now, draft picks. Coming off the NFL draft. Uh, let's talk about our picks. So, what you're seeing here is you're seeing top row bottom row so we me and adrian went into the safe of course he went in first and he grabbed a couple of watches i would have grabbed myself but uh he always said I'm, I'm gonna let you go first show me what you pick what are your picks and these are our picks for i couldn't say for the year or for the month or for the week literally we have hundreds of watches so we went downstairs and said adrian pick a few that are your picks tell me why real quick let's go through it you got five watches let's start which one do you want to start <laughs> okay with? let's start i'll hold them you talk about them i'll start from right to left so the first one we have here is the mbnf legacy legacy machine perpetual in yellow gold and i've touched on this watch before on my social media Damn. i've spoken to a lot of clients about it and uh one of the reasons i picked it was because again it's coming back to the independence it's coming back to the value and i got wrist time with this timepiece and it shocked me how much i love this piece the the feel of it how about the fact that it's the easiest perpetual <coughs> set? Excuse me. Again, I'm getting all choked up about this watch. Yeah. The ease of use on this perpetual calendar. Shout out calendar, to Max Buser. The ease of use on this perpetual calendar is the best I have ever seen. You don't need any tools. You just click the buttons. It sets everything. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about overshooting it. It looks phenomenal, skeletonized. I mean, that's pretty much. How about aesthetics? I mean, it's, aesthetics it's, it's is a crazy sick. looking watch. I absolutely love this watch. Next one looks like a 15202 okay BA. so i'm gonna go with the 15202 ba guys and although this watch is trading for a significant premium over over retail i will say this i have not seen many 15202 bas made period they are extremely extremely rare would and you say this is the 15 the 15202 tone 
the 15202. Absolutely. I, I mean, they, they make them in rose gold. They make them obviously in stainless steel, which to me is is the most overrated watch ever. Uh, but the one in yellow gold, it's extremely rare. And this is a 2021 example. It's the only 2021 example I've actually seen on the market. And I like the champagne on, on yellow look. The AP doesn't on a really scale do of one to 10, this versus the BC Salmon Dow, which, is, which would be the 10 and what would be the other one? If this is a 10, where's the 15202 BC Salmon Dow rank? Oof. A nine? Okay, I would yeah. say it's a close second, if yeah. not, if not, if yeah. not even. Yeah. Ooh, the okay, Olive so, Day Day. So I'm gonna go with the Olive Day Day because I am actually a bigger fan of colored dials on white metals. A white gold day date with the olive dial to me is just aesthetic perfection. I actually prefer, I'm going to get a lot of slack for this, but I prefer it over the rose gold. The rose gold green is actually a bit feminine for me. It is. It just, okay. it just is. I, I don't know why. With the white metal, it just pops. It's clean. It's sleek. Not to mention, I know olive dial production right now is like damn near impossible to get. So, in terms of bang for your buck right now, I think this is this is a, a fantastic choice. I hate to do this to you, but I like that watch with the blue dial versus the olive. You know, different color dial. Richard Mill. So I chose a sixty-seven hundred one lifestyle, as they call it, extra thin, because to me this is actually the most dynamic and diverse Richard Mill I think in their catalog. And what I mean by that is this is a watch that you can wear to the beach. This is also a watch you can wear with a tux. Not a lot of Richard Meals that you can put on the really, shirt. Yeah, there's really not a lot. You know, carbon elements and big and bulky. You can't really wear with the suit. This fits perfectly well with the suit. I've worn it with the suit before. I've worn it to the beach before. Uh, and it's one of the watches. It's one of the 6701s that people actually like to wear. A lot of times people buy RMs just to put them away. They don't really get a lot of wrist time with them. And they try to flip them on later. This one gets a lot of wear. Not flashy, but makes a point, yeah. I would say. And then the last one I chose I chose was the Royal Oak Perpetual East Klein dial. And this goes back to collectability. It comes back to how rare it is. And that's the reason that I chose it. If I was parking money into these assets, for lack of a better term, I would park them in the 39 millimeter Royal Oaks. And especially a piece like this, which is an East Klein dial, you will not go out there and find another one. So that is the reason I picked it. 39 millimeter is the perfect case size for me. And the Perpetual is the most aesthetically pleasing to me. Funny you should say that because I am wearing a 39. Oh, oh, we knew this was going to happen. I am wearing a 39 millimeter. That's also super rare. This is a stainless steel with a platinum bezel. Very few examples made of this particular thing. What sets this watch apart? It's the only one that has a rotor that is actually black and sick. So kind of like to match the dial. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely agree on a 39 millimeter chronos. Let's go to my picks and my picks. I'm going to start from left to right, at least your right to left. And we talked about going backwards to some pieces that are no longer made and are sort of rare and there's value for the dollar. Uh, this is a Turbion. This is a Royal Oak Turbion chronograph. Uh, Restivo. It's a Restivo edition, which big authorized dealer out in there. It's probably the biggest. It was the biggest. I don't know if he still is a door for them, but he was the biggest door in probably out of Europe when it came to Audemars Piguet. But I always talk about, again, value. Chronograph, Turbion. Audemars Piguet, Royal Oak, 25 pieces made. A watch with that the bez with the ceramic bezel that you can pick up for less money than the Royal Oak 15202 BA. It's insanity. Yep. Downside, need a big wrist. Size. 45 millimeters. Size, yep. But nevertheless, I always say I'm using that watch as an example of going backwards, finding something that's super rare. Where's the value going to be 10, 20, 30 years from now? Mm -hmm. It's going to be in pieces such as this. Uh, next, I picked the the new paddock world time and platinum the green and the 30 platinum that is thank you for the reference oh, number so. this reference number police so i didn't even say a reference number but yeah, look at 50 the 5930 p from paddock the reason i picked this particular watch is that a i was always a fan of the world time from paddock and finally finally i am seeing values catch up for what the watch really is if you look at some of the older world times speaking of going back and buying deals some of the older 5110 uh 5130 the values are there. You get so much bang for your dollar. This is, you know, on a world time watch in terms of complication, in terms of the brand name. But I, I think the second reason, the biggest reason I picked this watch, because personally, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this is the best green in the market today. Color -wise. Phenomenal. This is the most phenomenal green color. I think it's better than the Rolex Daytona. I think it's better than some of the APs. I certainly think it's a lot better than the Paddock 5711 green, which almost oh, looks yeah. black. Extreme, extremely um, underwhelming. 
speaking nice. speaking of rarities, right? And speaking of big brands, yes, there is an Omega in here. And you guys are thinking, oh my God, Omegas are running the mill. They make so much, so many watches. There's a you know a Speedmaster made for every day of the week, and blah 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 blah. But Omega is rich in history. It goes back a lot. Omega is the first watch to put a tourbillon in a wristwatch, right? Well, Brigade created it, but Omega were the first ones to put it in the actual watch. This isn't the one, but this is something that's super rare. This is the central tourbillon from Omega, and I have to tell you, for the first time in 20 years, I have this watch in my hand. Uh, the central tourbillon have been made in many, many variations. But to find a skeleton version of this watch, also with a baguette bezel, is next to impossible. Hand-decorated movement front and back. Uh, it's got a sticker on it. I need to take this off because you guys really have to appreciate, appreciate this movement. When I saw this watch, I literally fell in love with it. And I told you guys before, I don't buy watches for myself. You know, I kind of own every watch that's here, right? So for me, uh, the only thing I can do is to wish that it takes a while to sell this watch so that I can get some wrist time with this particular watch. And I will get this off, I promise you, eventually. They do. Natalie does a great Very job. job. Somebody <laughs> called Natalie the shipping dominatrix. I walked, I walked, I walked into the shipping room and I was messing around with Ilya. I'm like, Ilya, I said, you're going to have to put on a rubber suit tomorrow. He's like, what are you talking about? What, is, what, what rubber suit? What I need? I said, you got to. Please, I don't want to see that. Yeah, I don't either. But I go, I, I go. He's like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, you know, Natalie's been dubbed the shipping dominatrix. So she's coming in with a whip tomorrow and you have to wear a rubber suit. He's like, he's because like, he knows the crazy shit we do here. Anyway, let me look. Let me show you this movement. If we can get a good zoom on this so you can see how well this movement is decorated, how beautiful this watch is aesthetically. And this is a super rare watch. They made 10 of these. So, yes, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Paddock. Remember, Omega is still up there on the top list. It doesn't necessarily have to be a uh, is it automatic, by the way. Here we go. There's a move. There it goes. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a Paddock or a Richard Meal and Audemars Piguet. Yes, AP is still my favorite brand, but there's so many things out there that can wow you from a brand that you wouldn't expect it from, i.e., Omega. Absolutely. And on to the next watch, I went with this. In the, well, I went with obviously MBNF as well. Again, one of my favorite independents out there. I reviewed this on what's on my desk. I won't go into much details on this watch, but if I had to go with something that one has never seen before, if I had to go with something that's just like when somebody comes up and says, Holy shit, what is that? Yep. It's going to be MBNF. And the HM6 is certainly that. Holy shit, what is that? Watch? Still trying to figure out how to tell the time. It's very simple, actually. <laughs> the kidding. two bubbles on the bottom. <laughs> and last but not least, I gotta go to the king. And again, keeping with the theme of going backwards, how do you go into the sea of a brand that made millions upon millions and millions of watches and pick something out that is a standout, that is a true collectible, will be for the times to come that you will never see again? And the answer is Comex, right? The Comex dial Rolexes. You know, and this is the, one of the newer models. Uh, the Co the Comex dial Rolex has always been rare, and and the value in these things has always been. And I should have brought this: is the provenance that comes with the watch. It's the diver diving records. It's the fact of which diver this belongs to. This watch is numbered in the back with the diver's number, right? So That's if you amazing. look, and of course it's wrapped up again. I guess I'll have to take this off again. Natalie's gonna love this. Um, shit. Hold on, I got this. I promise. Let's talk about Natalie Dominatrix while I do this. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm I didn't say Dominatrix. I'm super, I'm, in, uh, in Russian, I have in, no idea. Can't say Russian anymore. It's, yeah, it's in so Ukrainian. Good. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so if you look at the back of the watch, you see the diver's number in the back. And we have like books upon super books cool. upon books of provenance that comes with this watch. This is a watch that will, I'll go out on the limb and say, will always hold its value and go up in value because to find these samples with all the provenance and everything else that comes along with them, uh, is very, very rare because a lot of these divers didn't keep any of that information. And to be able to find all that as a complete set is super rare. And again, one of those watches, if the condition is there and the provenance is there, it's sort of like a name your price watch, right? Uh, so that's going to finish off our draft picks. I want to get into Formula One. Is it, are we doing questions before this or are we going right into Formula One? I don't think we have any questions. I don't think, we, well, we, I'm sure we do, but... I, no questions on this topic. We'll go into uh, Formula One. Adrian, I know you're a big Formula One guy. I know you follow Formula One. I don't. So what do you have to talk? Let's talk about Even though you're going coming to the race. Yeah, we are going to the we're race. Going to we're going to be at F1 Miami. next weekend. Um, thanks. Shout out to uh, uh, my friend Adam that stood in line at like 7 in the morning when they released the ticket sales and managed <laughs> <to get them. laughs> That's good. That's a good impression. Uh, shout out to Adam because the – 
in order to get a suite for 30 people. He literally got up at five o'clock in the morning and stood in line. But speaking of Formula One, Charles, uh, uh, Charles Leclerc's Richard Meal. Yeah. The one that was stolen. Yep. Yeah. That's inside it at an F1 event. Yeah. What are you going to wear to F1? Like after this, like if Charles Leclerc can get his Richard Meal stolen from him, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I think I, I'm going to wear a swatch. I, I, I don't really know the detail of, of how that happened, but supposedly there was an event that took place. And at that event, it was like a signing. It was like a picture taken yeah. event. And a fan came up to take a picture or get an autograph or something. But the 6702, it's like, it, I'm trying to understand how that happened because it's on an elastic band. And if, if you are wearing the correct size elastic elastic band it's what, not that he, easy to but they also come in different bands There's also the velcro band which is even harder I don't because know, it makes I don't, noise well and they go and it exactly. comes right off but the well look let's let's consider this our in-house videographer slash yeah. magician cameron uh, did a trick the other day sleight, sleight where where it's not slight it's not sleight of hand so alex was sitting downstairs and pick a card any card blah 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 blah, and this that and the other and then poof the card disappears and he goes look under your watch mm -hmm. And Alice was wearing a Schumacher where, yeah, he, yeah. where he pulled the damn thing out of under his face. Like, I didn't feel him putting it on there. So yeah. if you could have done that, I'm sure somebody out there is just as good to steal a watch. But it's a damn shame. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to wear to F1. Or at least I'm definitely not meeting and greeting then or something. I'm going to I'm gonna do one of these at, 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 yeah, at I mean, the F1 event. Talk about uh, uh, F1 sponsors. I mean, obviously, Rolex is king, right? Well, IWC, Richard, uh, Tag. Tag Heuer sponsors some races. I'm not sure if they're sponsoring any of the drivers of the cars that I'm not sure. Uh, so big, big, big sponsorships. And you guys talked about celebrities. Let's talk about huge events. F1 is humongous worldwide. There's a reason why Rolex sponsors the whole damn thing. There's a reason why Richard Mille plasters his name all over the cars and Tag Heuer and IWC among with many, many other brands. So it's not just the celebrities, if you will, that are having an impact. I feel like it's a double impact, right? You have the event itself, the F1 event itself. You have the cars themselves, but also be inside every car is a celebrity just the same. These F1 it's car huge. drivers, they're huge celebrities in their own right. F1 has a humongous following. I would probably say Europe and Asia is a bigger following than that of the United States. Oh, absolutely. Well, they were considering that they only have one race in America. It's the first well, time. Well, they have the Vegas one, too. With coming. That's coming. 2023. Right. But they had the one in Texas. But it's the first time it's coming to Miami, so it's clearly it's a European sport. How about no the, doubt about it? Uh, why don't you tell them uh, what you found out about Carbone in Miami for this oh, weekend? Oh, yeah. So Carbone in Miami, apparently they're charging $3,000 a seat. And I don't know if that means like that's a minimum spent per person or what food. that means, but it's $3,000 if you want to sit at Carbone. Well, at this point, you can't get in. But but to just finish up with sponsors, like I said, sometimes it's not just the celebrities. These, these watch companies are smart. It's using big, big, big events that can be super impactful because you, you get the double impact with the event itself and the celebrities behind it. And moving right into, and this is what we just kind of said about Carbone impact on Miami. I made our dinner reservations. Well, not me, your wife and my wife yes. made dinner reservations like two months ahead of time, and they were already having a hard time. We had a pretty big party, but uh, they were having a very hard time getting, um, you know, seats at restaurants. Uh, clubs, any and all events in Miami, Miami is going to be mobbed. There's going to be a lot of people that are not just flying in from all over the US, but also internationally. Some of the international followers coming into Miami. It's got to be one of the biggest draws of people that's possible. I mean, you got you have like the music festivals that bring a lot of people into Miami. In terms of actual people, there's more, but in terms of money, like elite people from all over the world with a lot of money. A lot of money is going to be brought into Miami, Miami today. Miami. Almost makes me wish that I took the suite that we got and turned it into a watch shop, but, but oh, uh, cool. we're going to be there to enjoy F1 because I've never been to an F1 event. I've never been to an F1 I, event either. I, but you kind of follow F1, you yeah. know what's going on. You're going to know who's who. I'm going to have to have you like, you know, give me the cliff notes while we're down there because I think, and we're going to try to, uh, uh, we're going to try to um, vlog something. Like I'll bring a camera with me and I'm going to try to vlog and show you some of that stuff. And by the way, Davis back there just pointed out that, the F1 event in Miami is more expensive than the one in Monaco. Which is, is that right? Yeah, huh. which is pretty crazy. Interesting. Which is huh. pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, guys, I am going to uh, take some questions now. We're taking questions or no? Uh, we're just going to – oh, we're not. No questions. No questions. All right. So, guys, I am going to uh, tell you another thing. Uh, last topic is going to be watchesforgood.org, which is our charity organization. I wanted to give you guys a quick update because I know a lot of you guys have donated. A lot of you guys have uh, helped in many ways and other. 
just to give you That's some incredible by the way some incredible incredibly generous donations and support it's it's unbelievable exactly it's there's unbelievable. guys that made donations upwards of twenty thousand dollars there are guys that made donations of fifty dollars and both are equally as important uh so ever since we decided to put up an amazon list my downstairs lobby of my office has become the hub of taking the stuff in and getting it out all in all in total 200 and uh actually i had those numbers here <laughs> I, I'm going to give you some exact numbers, to be honest with you. I had them on my phone, um, and that was – so gross donations was $197,206.81, of which every single penny went to Ukraine, plus about $40,000 in goods donations. Uh, and that is abs absolutely amazing because we're talking about $237,206.81 in total that we managed to raise – for a wonderful cause. And another step, another interesting thing I'll tell you, Nino, our CEO, just sent me this. Um, oh, let's see. Where is that? Palmetto Gourmet Foods, located in North Carolina, would like to make a donation of ramen noodles to Ukrainian refugees. The shipment would contain 48 pallets, where each pallet has 110 cases of ramen, which weighs 300 pounds. Each case has 12 cups of ramen that can overall produce 63,360 soups. Yeah. And if you guys, I, I mean, I went to college and we all been single. Ramen, ramen, ramen soup was the shit to have, ramen. and it's a quick and easy meal. meal. You add hot water, and it's good. It actually is good. It is <laughs> extremely, extremely good. So to get 63,000 uh, soups donated, that's 63,000 people that can be potential fed. We're working out the logistics because right now that's three containers that we need to get from North Carolina over to Poland, then into Ukraine. I'm sure we'll figure all that part out. Thank you so much, Palmetto Food Group. Uh, worth mentioning the gentleman that we had somebody donate a watch. Yep. They literally made it watches for good, right? The IWC that we auctioned off on a gray market group. Uh, thank you for the gentleman that donated as well as the gentleman that purchases. So we're doing good. Doesn't mean we're stopping. If you guys haven't donated or want to donate more and want to help out with this effort, and uh, which will hopefully be over very, 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 very soon, because that's what we're hoping for. We're hoping that we don't have to do any help. I'm sure post-war there will be a lot of help that's needed. But if any of you guys want to help out some more, go to the website, click the link to donate. Uh, every penny counts. Uh, so... Uh, hope you guys uh, like this format, right? Uh, the way we did it. I think by setting 90 second limits, it allowed agents we'll to actually horn. talk. We'll have, we'll have a horn next time. Yeah, we need a horn. Yeah. Definitely need a horn. But uh, I think that this format allowed Adrian not to just sit there and look pretty and listen to me most of the time. But oh, actually, you pretty. Thank I you. do. I do. Uh, and uh, I appreciate you guys tuning into this live. Again, we can't answer everyone's questions. We try to pick them the best we can. But the idea is to go through all these topics that I'm sure were a lot on your guys' minds to answer. And I hope we did that in regards to the market condition. Overall, I'm going to say sit tight, don't panic. Enjoy the world of watches because it is a wonderful world to be in. Your final thoughts, Adrian. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of piggyback off of what you said, I, I really try to tell people to not focus so much about obviously nobody wants to lose money on anything, you know, but I I really want the passion to come back into the actual horology and actual collecting and, and just watches in general, because too much focus has been put on pricing and that kind of takes away the passion, the passion of it. And, that, and that's a shame. You know, is, we is. got into this business because of our love for watches, uh, some of the best uh, relationships we've formed ha has been with people that love watches, right? So we have a lot of love for them and to just completely, completely put them right next to finances and whether they're, go they're going up and down really, really takes, it takes, takes it, takes, it, it takes the passion out. Yeah. It takes out the person, per the personable factor. You have guys out there buying stuff. They have no idea what they even have or what they even bought. They, they have zero clue in terms of horological value. And if you are one of those people that is buying these things as pure investments, at least take the time to learn about those watches. Uh, and I guarantee if you take a little bit of time and you look into the history of these things, if you look at the fact of how these are mechanical wonders, I guarantee your passion will be sparked just as much as mine was 20 years ago and eight agents about 15 years ago. Other than that, guys, I want to thank you for tuning in on this live. You know what to do. Subscribe, hit the like button, do all those things. You can share this video with those that didn't catch it live. And we'll be doing these once in a while. But other than that, we'll see you guys next week on Gray Market.